12, welcome back. Unit three, revolution up to 50%. We are going to talk about speaking today, exactly. So I'd like you uh, to open your textbook for listening and speaking, and I want you to go to page 76. All right, here we go. Today is the focus on speaking, and we started with the review of the vocabulary. So basically, the vocabulary that you have learned throughout Unit 3 is going to be reviewed in different ways. That's actually really cool, because from there, you now really have to put into practice what you have learned throughout the unit. Ready, right? Right. Okay, so how does birth order affect personality? Some researchers believe that being the firstborn, the only child, or the baby in the family has a significant impact. Now, if we're looking at Indonesia, the firstborn uh, somehow cultural-wise has like a different responsibility. There are bigger or higher expectations from the firstborn, and the babies are mostly, generally in the world, mostly assumed as to be spoiled, right? So. Does that have any impact? Now, here there are on the next page, we see, I'll show you. Here we see letters um, to a newspaper. Yeah, birth order, does it matter? Stardaily.com, each week the Star Daily posts our favorite responses to questions posed to our, posed to our readers. Here are our favorites. So it's about birth order and does it matter? So we have one, two, three, four letters that are given and these letters has to be have to be completed with the correct vocabulary now you're looking at this box we've got uh, attributes came to light carried away colossal waste cranky crave diagnose fill the void groomed for make lemonade out of lemons mindful of orientation put one stamp on something run with and wallow in one's misery now those uh that is the vocabulary, those are the words and the phrases that we've been talking about throughout this unit. Now, you're going to pause your video and put the correct word or phrase in the correct place. I would like to start the first one together, yeah? Dear Star Daily, like most later born children, as the youngest of five, I am now we here have the phrase aware of. Now you gotta find the word or the synonym, the phrase that resembles uh, aware of. Which one in this list is aware of? Now in this case, that is mindful of. Mindful of is a synonym for aware of. So here you will write mindful of. And I'd like you to do that from number one until number 15. Okay, you're going to take some time to do this. Be precise, work with it. If you're confused, you can look it up. Yeah, uh, pause your video to complete this activity. Go ahead. Great, that brings us to the expansion of using the vocabulary. Go a little bit further, we're still working with words and phrases. And here it talks about English as a wealth of vocabulary to talk about personality and temperament. Now, you're going to write each word, now each word in the most appropriate category. As you can see here, we have the category of behavior and the category of attitude, which are two different things. And that's what we've been talking about throughout this unit. As a behavior, you have an introvert and an extrovert, remember? like uh, we talked a lot about the difference between these two, and that refers to behavior. But if we're looking at an attitude is how we respond to things, is either a pessimist or an optimist. So the pessimist is more negative and the optimist is more positive. Now, what you're gonna do, you're gonna write each word or phrase in the most appropriate category on the chart, yeah? Some words may fit in more than one category. Okay, so I'd like you to try it out, to think about it. Hey, which goes where? Okay, you can pause your video to do that. Go ahead. Awesome, so cool. Now, we were supposed to do uh, activity two, which is actually really nice. 
but since we don't meet in the classroom we can't do that yet that's a pity yeah we're supposed to just you know like role play this conversation where you practice an introduction about yourself like if you were to send like a two to three minute video introduction of yourself to a dating service what would you state in your introduction it's kind of interesting but i would want to know it's funny <laughs> yeah but we're not gonna do that okay so that brings us to create yeah so remember with the vocabulary the first thing we do is review the vocab then we expand using it in a different setting and then we create something with the vocab so there are questions on the next page and you're going to discuss the answers and defend your opinion you can use the words from the box these ones you can use uh to incorporate in your answers <clears throat> Yeah, you can, you're going to express yourself, give your opinion. Play the devil's advocate if possible. And what is that? Now, play the devil's advocate means that you support a less popular opinion, the one that not everybody likes, but you defend that in order to encourage a debate. <clears throat> so I want you to go over these questions by yourself and out loud to yourself, I want you to express yourself since we can't do it in pairs right now. I still want you to do this uh, at home. So in class, I'm going to through a Zoom meeting where I'm going to ask these questions so you are ready to respond. So who would you rather have? This is an example. Um, who would you rather have for a doctor? Now the first one, it says here, highly experienced, but also uh, reticent and a bit reserved, <coughs> or a recent medical school graduate who is also outgoing always makes laminate out of lemons means always sees the positive side so here the first picture shows it's definitely broken i wonder how much i need to tell him this kind of doctor or the kind of doctor that says it's probably broken but hey you get to stay in bed for a whole week which kind of doctor would you want this one a or b now I'd like you to respond to that. So practice that by yourself. Uh, take your pick, state your opinion, and remember to use P and PL, right? Point, explanation, the reasons, and evidence, and link it back. Okay, and you could use any of the words from the box. Here we have number two, who would you rather have for your teacher? Gregarious, can talk, a blue streak, but also is gloomy at times or confident, but also is a bit self-conscious or antisocial at times. Oh, these are hard picks. Or three, who, who would you rather have as a spouse? That means as a partner. Or who would you rather have as your tour guide on vacation? Oh, these are not easy. Okay, pause your video and try it by yourself right now. You don't look funny if you do that. <laughs> I'll let your family know hey, I'm gonna practice my speaking and yeah. try it out please do it out loud and if some of the words you don't know just google them for a sec yeah make this uh, a time for you to practice your speaking okay pause your video go ahead good luck awesome beans I wish I was there to hear you speak up I believe you did great so during our zoom meeting you're gonna answer yeah remember that Okay, that brings us to grammar. Oh boy, such a serious part, yet yeah, so important, beloved. Yes. So in this case, we're going to look at adjective clauses. Yeah, now you're in grade 12. I've already taught you the whole system of um, syntax before in grade 10 and in grade 11. Just so you remember, we have four different types of sentences, right? Simple sentence, compound sentence, complex sentence, and compound complex sentence. Now, we also have two different types of clauses. Remember, a sentence consists of a clause or clauses. So we either have an independent clause or we have a dependent clause, right? Now, a simple sentence consists out of one independent clause. A compound sentence is not too hard. That consists out of two independent clauses. They're connected by using a coordinating conjunction which we call fanboys for and nor but or yet so now we use a comma before it then we have a complex sentence now this, this, the word says it becomes trickier we have one independent clause and one or more dependent clauses which are connected by now either a subordinating conjunction that stands for time place reason and contrast or a relative pronoun 
that depends on what type of dependent clauses you use okay then we've got a compound complex sentence those are the long sentences most complicated we use at least two independent clauses and one or more dependent clauses we will have to incorporate a coordinating conjunction and either subordinating or related pronoun yeah now going back to the dependent clauses we've got three kinds we've got adjective clause adverb clause and a noun clause yeah the adverb the adverb clause the adverb dependent clause is the one that further explains the action that is mentioned in the independent clause or main clause and that always uses a subordinate conjunction if it's a noun clause it replaces the subject or the object and it uses the wh and wh ever word like when where who or whoever whenever whatever yeah now today we're going to look at the adjective dependent clause which is adding information to a noun that is mentioned in the independent clause so this is a quick review for you you can just also look it up you can google it you already had this in grade 10 and 11 so for you guys you should already know this even what we're going to talk about right now is identifying and non-identifying dependent clauses you already know but let this today be a uh, review okay if it's still hard please let me know but you can also google things yeah examine the sentences and discuss the questions that follow so we have which she started in 2005 who had a secret sense of shame about who they were now so for the adjective dependent clauses we do not use a subordinate conjunction but we use a relative pronoun so we've got which who whom and that for people we would use who whom that for things we would use that and which okay depending on what you're referring to here we have that here we have whose yeah so the related pronoun always refers back to a subject or noun that is mentioned before it for example Kane's research which which refers back to the research focused on many introverts who who refers back to the introverts or for example here many extroverts thinks of themselves as leader whose role refers back to leaders so a uh, related pronoun always refers back to something that is mentioned prior to it so please answer what is the purpose of the underlined clauses and compare the five underlined clauses are they similar or are they different in what way are they similar or in what way are they different what do you think okay cool that brings us to the next part i will uh, talk about that with you during our zoom meeting so make sure you have answered that okay that brings us to the adjective clauses identifying and non-identifying yeah adjective clauses are used to add variety sophistication and interest to sentences they are useful in combining sentences to provide more detail and information so they give like more explanation uh, there are two kinds of adjective clauses you have identifying and non-identifying i think back then in class i mentioned it as restrictive and non-restrictive it's the same thing so identifying would be restrictive and non-identifying would be non-restrictive now the identifying adjective clauses um, are necessary to be used in a sentence because without it the sentence will become unclear yeah so that is an, a dependent clause that has to be added for the sentence to make sense and because it is necessary you cannot not use a comma if it is a non-identifying adjective clause non-restrictive means that the information that is added which is the dependent clause is not necessary can be added but without it the sentence still makes sense so in that case we do use commas okay 
Let's go back here. Identifying adjective clause has a subject and a verb. Modify specific nouns and pronouns. It can be introduced by who, who, that for people, and which, that for things, whose, for people, where, and when can also be used as place and time. It is not set off by commas and essential to the meaning of the sentence because without it, it doesn't make sense. A Pollyanna is a person. If I say a Pollyanna is a person, you wouldn't understand what I'm saying. So we have to add who has an overly optimistic outlook. That's why there is no comma. Now we're looking at a non-identifying adjective clause, also has a subject and a verb, is used with a related pronoun who, whom, which, and whose. It is also used with where and when and cannot be used with that. Okay, this needs to be remembered. So basically the related pronouns that are used for the identifying and non-identifying are the same. The difference only is with non-identifying, you cannot use that because that never is set off with a comma. Yeah, you, for the rest you would probably, you can use them to uh, use them with commas, but not that. So that's why in a non-identifying you cannot use it because a non-identifying clause needs a comma. Must describe a specific person or thing is set off by commas, this one, and is not essential to the meaning of the sentence and may be omitted. Yeah, so remember that for non-identifying we do not use that. Then we have quantifying expressions. Non-identifying adjective clauses often contain expressions of quantity. Quantity means how much, like an amount, such as many of, most of, some of, none of, two of, several of, half of, all of, each of, both of, and a number of. Now use the structure, like the quantifier plus the preposition, and then the related pronoun. Only you use who, whom, where, when, or which. For instance, negative attributes, most of which are false, can, are often applied to introverts. Or Kane's interviewees, all of whom were introverts, felt that they were starting to be accepted by society. So you could use a quantifying expression to start the adjective dependent clause. Yeah? So it doesn't always, so that starts off with most of and then which, or all of and then whom, or half of and then uh, who, you know, can. So you can use those quantifiers in front of the related pronoun, but you only do that for non-identifying adjectives because that is like extra information that does not necessarily have to be mentioned. If I would say negative attributes are often applied to introverts, it's still okay, makes sense. Yeah, so remember to use the quantifying expressions only for the non-identifying adjective clauses which need a comma because that additional information is not necessary. Awesome beans. Now, uh, if this is still difficult for you, you're still confused, it's the same as what I talked about last year, but if it's still hard for you, please um, let me know and through Zoom we can rediscuss that, okay? But you got to understand and remember the four types of sentences, that we have three types of dependent clauses, and that this lesson is about the one type, which is the adjective clause, the adjective dependent clause, which is divided by identifying and non-identifying. Okay. okay, here you have to underline all the adjective clauses and circle the related pronouns, see if you can find it, and then draw an arrow from each clause to the noun it modifies and label the clause I or N. Oh boy, this is three in one, right? So underline adjective clause, circle the related clause, oh, four things, draw an arrow to, which, to what it modifies and four Write down whether it's identifying or non identifying. Four things in one. Awesome beans. And that in a paragraph, that's cool. So, for instance, here we have the first one who is a management professor at the Wharton Business School. How do I know that this is an adjective dependent clause? Because there is who. Yeah, remember, an adjective dependent clause always starts with either who, or whom, or whose, or that, or which. Or maybe the quantifier, most of which, with the quantifiers, that's also possible. So if it starts with that, and it has a comma before it, it is definitely an adjective-dependent clause, okay? 
That's also how you would know what an, an adjective dependent clause. That's also how you would know an adverb dependent clause because it would start with a subordinate conjunction. So that's how you would know. Okay? Full beans. Now, um, just as a reminder, the difference though with an adverb dependent clause is that you only use a comma when the sentence starts with the dependent clause. Then you have a comma in the middle and then the independent clause. But if you start a sentence with the independent clause following the dependent clause, then you don't use a comma. That is for the adverb dependent clauses. Yeah, remember that one. But today we're talking about the adjective dependent clause. We're talking about identifying and non-identifying. So this one you underline because it's the adjective clause. You circle who because that's the related pronoun with the arrow that refers to Adam Grant. Yeah, one, two, three, and then four, you write an M because it's non-identifying. That's why there is a comma, right? So who is a management professor at Wharton Business School in Philadelphia, comma? So that is basically, um, uh, yeah, that's non-identifying because it has commas. If it is identifying, remember, it has no commas. Okay, you're going to pause your video and go over this to figure it out. Let me tell you how many we've got though, so you have an idea. Okay, I'm gonna help you out a little bit here. There are eight. So this is number one. Let me see, is that included or not? Uh, one yeah think about that okay pause your video and try it out go ahead Okay, cool. So you've done that, that we're uh, in, <clears throat> in total eight sentences that you would have uh, found, basically. Awesome beans. And that brings us right now to the part where we're looking at, uh, we have here student A and student B. Student A asks um, student B questions, so one through four. <clears throat> And then you switch roles and then student B covers the left column and answers the, answer the questions using a variety of adjective clauses in your answer. So the whole point of this is actually to try to have a conversation and using the adjective clauses in your answers. Yeah? Like who is Adam Grant? For example, who is Adam Grant? Oh, he's the, the one who led the study of leadership. Yeah? The one who led, who led the study on leadership. So here you see uh, the usage of the related pronoun who. And then the other question, for example, what was the conclusion of Grant's study? Hmm, I think that. So I'd like you to practice this. So in class, if I can ask some of you to answer this, that you are able to do so. So try to answer the questions by using the adjective dependent clause. Exactly, cool. Okay, take some time to do that. Awesome, that brings us to the pronunciation. And in the pronunciation, we're talking about um, grouping words together. Like how are words get it together? When you speak, group your words in shorter phrases or thought groups. We can also call them thought groups because it's like those words together form one thought. Now like punctuation and writing, thought groups help the listener understand speech. 
Yeah, so it makes something more understandable. So pronounce the words in a thought group together. For example, I'm the firstborn from a large family. Do you see, like sometimes you have this pause in between? Or join thought groups together smoothly, hold or lengthen them, the end of one thought group briefly before you start the next group. So there is often a small change in the pitch of your voice between thought groups. Like, I'm the firstborn from a large family. For example, like that. There are no fixed rules for the length of thought groups. Many thought groups are also grammatical groupings. For example, non-identifying clauses. So sometimes the thought groups, if you look at them, could also refer to a certain clause. Yeah? Now, as you become more fluent, you will be able to use longer thought groups. You would know how to place the words together and how to pronounce them and how to make, I don't know how to put the, like how to put the emphasis on them as well. Now, I'd like you to listen to this because this is a very good example. Listen to the sentences and underline the thought groups. So please listen to this and underline the thought groups that you're hearing, okay? And then maybe afterwards you can practice reading them by yourself. Yeah? Okay, let's go. One. We discovered that about 40% of all Americans label themselves as currently shy. Two. Over the past 10 years, that figure has increased to about 48%. Three. Do you find these days that it's more difficult meeting people? Four. Two out of every five people you meet think of themselves as shy. Five. There are just many things in a culture, our culture, which lead lots of people to be introverted. Six. Children don't see, don't have the opportunity to see their parents and relatives relating in a natural, easy, friendly way. Seven. When you're at a party or just in a conversation with someone anywhere, and you recognize that the person is shy, what do you do to draw that person out or try to make him or her more comfortable? Eight. Admitting your shyness is really an important first step because if you don't, people make misattributions. Okay, so you basically don't have to underline. You can also just, uh, you know, put a line like slash, like this um, steep line in between to separate it to see what is which thought group i'm gonna let you listen to it one more time check your answers or maybe you can answer the ones you've missed one we discovered that about 40 percent of all americans label themselves as currently shy two over the past 10 years that figure has increased to about 48 percent three do you find these days that it's more difficult meeting people? Four. Two out of every five people you meet think of themselves as shy. Five. There are just many things in a culture, our culture, which lead lots of people to be introverted. Six. Children don't see, don't have the opportunity to see their parents and relatives relating in a natural, easy, friendly way. Seven. When you're at a party, or just in a conversation with someone anywhere, and you recognize that the person is shy, what do you do to draw that person out or try to make him or her more comfortable? 8. Admitting your shyness is really an important first step, because if you don't, people make misattributions. Yes, very good. Okay, I'll give you some time to check your answers. Okay, cool. That brings us to the next part. Here are some results. That was my Google. <laughs> Listen to the sentences and circle the letter of the one you hear. Yeah, so you're going to listen and you circle either A or B. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. So, for example, number one, Philip, said the doctor doesn't suffer from shyness, suffer from shyness, or Philip said the doctor doesn't suffer from shyness. Which one do you hear? Circle the one that you hear. We have number one until six. 
one. Philip, said the doctor, doesn't suffer from shyness. Two. My sister who lives in California is a Pollyanna. Three. Suzanne's manager told me she's gotten over her shyness. Four. The researcher interviewed the students who said they were introverted. Five. Everything he said was based on research. Six. The therapy, which the clinic provides, gets people to be more outgoing. Yes, very good. Okay, so you heard that and you were supposed to answer the correct uh, letter of it. Well done. So that brings us to the speaking skill right now. Uh, breaking the ice and maintaining a conversation. In our speaking skill, like, how do you do that? How do you maintain a conversation? How do you break the ice? You know, sometimes when you talk to someone, it can be awkward in a way. How do we do this? Now, introversion is a natural and healthy personality trait, okay? An introvert. Everybody's different, but we are all important, equally important. But in certain situations, perhaps when speaking another language, many of us may share some traits of introverts. If suddenly you have to speak in English or in another language, you might feel like uncomfortable. That said, sometimes introverts need to act like extroverts in certain situations. In other words, some introverts need to move along the personality continuum towards an ambivert and behave like someone who enjoys social interaction as well as solitude. As an introvert doesn't always like to be with a lot of people, which is okay. For example, you were to do something you are not used to do, you feel uncomfortable as well, right? But you kind of are forced to do it. That's what they mean. You kind of have to act like an extrovert. Now, one skill that introverts can learn and master is how to break the ice and maintain a conversation, which will be helpful because then you get it going and the atmosphere will be cool, you know, rather than it becoming an awkward silence. No, right? So breaking the ice, for example, you could introduce yourself, comment on something shared, like talk about the weather, share a situation, uncontroversial news. For example, with introducing yourself, hey, how are you? Hello, I'm Susan Kane. Or comment on something shared. Nice weather, don't you think? Or how do you know the host? Or what a game last night, huh? You know, those are little things that kind of break the ice, which might really, really work, especially when you're in a situation where you feel like uncomfortable. Like for people that are extroverts, it's not so hard. They just automatically do that. Now, maintaining a conversation is like sometimes a conversation dies out. Like you start it, you go like, mm, and then it kind of ends. It's weird. Now, how do you let it, how do you maintain it so it doesn't die out? So you got to ask open questions, open ended questions and follow up questions like, hey, what brings you to, or what kind of work do you do? So those are no yes and no questions, you know? Or your volunteer information. For instance, you say, I'm a writer who studies personality temperament. What about you? Like that works too. Or you listen actively and look interested, you know? You use eye contact, you smile, you nod your head occasionally. Really? Hmm. You're kidding. No. Mm, wow. You know, stuff like that. You're engaging. Or you change the topic if the conversation is dying. and Or excuse yourself. For instance, you say, oh, yeah, on another topic, did you see? Or you say, excuse me, I'd like to get a drink. And then you're still polite, you know? <laughs> okay. All right, basically, you got to role play a situation from uh, the list. Student A starts the conversation. Both students keep it going for at least three minutes and then throwing it back and forth like a ball, right? And then use the chart above as a guide and then change roles and role play a second situation. So this is basically something that you should have been uh, doing in class uh, with me. Yeah, but we can't do that. So I don't know if we get to do this with Zoom, but I would still like you to try it out. For those who really want to try it out, please, please, please try it out at home. Just try to do this. Yeah, like here you have a situation, you are in a long checkout line, like you're queuing at the supermarket, and you start a conversation with the person behind you. What would you say? Yeah? In Zoom, let me try it out. If we have enough time, other than that, maybe you can try it out with your friend. Maybe you can do it through a phone call, video call, trying this out to practice your speaking. 
to you know break the ice and to keep a conversation going or you have situation b c and d yeah so please take time to practice this awesome means that is the end of our speaking uh, focus on speaking lesson today right and we um as we have come to the end of it i would like to review with you uh, what it is exactly what we did yeah just to remember and to review that so um That brings us to the beginning that we reviewed the vocabulary that we already talked about in this unit. We did that by, um, we reviewed all the words that we have had before. Yeah. And um, we did that in filling out this, uh, these letters in a table, like trying to find the right synonym for it. Then we expanded on the vocabulary, putting the right words and phrases in the right columns, categorizing them. And then we were supposed to create a conversation oh, by using the words in the box. After that, uh, we went into the grammar. We talked about syntax, the sentence types and the types of dependent clauses. And we focused on the adjective dependent clause, the identifying and non-identifying clauses and had to be able to recognize them in a paragraph and use them in a short conversation role play. Then we went over the pronunciation of grouping words together, which are in a way, uh, yeah, we call them word groups or thought groups, is how a speaker would say things or connect or glue words together. The thought groups basically are the words put together and that express one thought. So most of that, that's how we talk. We don't make it separate words. It becomes stagnant, it becomes rigid. Yeah. So in that way, we have the emphasis going and we group words together as in uh, um, bringing forth the right meaning. And you had to listen for that, recognize the thought groups while you were listening and hearing um, the exact sentence that was used by the speaker on the audio. And the last thing with the speaking skill, breaking the eyes and maintaining conversation, how do you break the ice when maintaining conversation? If it is an awkward situation or you don't know how to behave or you don't know the person, like what do we do to break the ice and to keep it going? Okay, that's the end of our lesson today. You did a great job, awesome. Uh, thank you for watching it. I'll see you very soon again and God bless you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.